gosh, so many great, beautiful faces on this call. So a couple things. Um, if you don't know what ADP list, guys, ADP list is a uh, it's a you know community that's built on strictly connection, right? A platform where people can find and book uh, mentorships, um, make new friends all around the world. Um, the goal for ADP list is inclusivity and keeping this open, obviously, to the entire planet. So um, find us on LinkedIn, find us on YouTube, find us on Twitter, whatever platform of your choice, follow us. For the event tonight, it's going to be, again, After Hours Uncensored. Um, there will be adult language. You've been forewarned. Um, I'm having a beer, so hopefully if it's that time of the day, feel free to join. Um, or if it's even if it's not, middle of the workday, who cares? Uh, but today we're going to be talking about uh, we are going to be talking about something that's really a hot topic, um, highly debated. I've been in a few arguments myself on LinkedIn about it. Design exercises in interviews. I'm very stoked for this one, guys. Very, very stoked. A um, lot to take away from this. We have some really great mentors joining us tonight. Um, but first, before I get to them, me, myself, my name is Casey Randall. I'm your host for the evening. I'm a senior interaction designer at SiriusXM. Um, fun fact about me. I have a dog, he's 10 years old, and he's like basically my whole world. Now, let's get to the guests. We've got Jonathan Yap, Maggie Pena, Jorel uh, Sanguicine. Oh my gosh, I almost oh, put your name. Sanguicine, yeah. Sanguicine, nice. Yeah. Thank you for jumping in there, man. I really appreciate that. Yeah, Natasha Tiendra. All right, guys. Well, Jonathan, I'm going to hand it up the mic over to Jonathan. Um, feel free to introduce yourself, guys. Uh, you know, who you are, what you do, and a fun fact about you. Thank you, Casey. So good morning, good afternoon, and evening, wherever you are. I'm Jonathan. So I am a uh, senior lead product designer from WeWork. Um, I'm based in Singapore, so it's the morning for me. Uh, so I'm getting my coffee. A uh, little fun fact about me is uh, anyone from Iceland, and I hope you bear with me because uh, um, I know how to pronounce uh, the volcano Elafayoku better than I can spell it. Because uh, I was once stranded by it, I had to take a 16-hour train ride back from Copenhagen to London. Uh, so that was a fun train ride. All right. So uh, I'm Maggie. I am one of the mentors. I currently work as a UX designer for an e-com platform. Um, I'm also part of Design Buddies, if you've heard of us. Um, come. Uh, Hi from Design Buddies and fun fact, I also pay the dog tax. I am a proud dog mom. I have two doggos. So that is that is me. I guess it's my turn. It's Jarell over here. Um, I'm the creative director for um, Securely. And yeah, I've been doing it for quite some time now. Uh, and fun fact about me, Jarell is actually, my parents got that from the father of Superman. So yeah. Nice. Superman's dad in the house. Hi, I'm Natasha. I'm a senior manager at EA. Um, I've been a UX hiring manager uh, who's implemented inclusive hiring processes. And I've been the receiving end of design challenges and I have a love-hate relationship with them. Fun fact, I'm drinking lemonade and uh, gin. Cheers. And my name has given a lot of people challenges. So my last name is pronounced as Chandra. Cool. So I'm going to kick it back to Kelsey. Casey? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think names are going to be our biggest challenge for tonight um, <laughs> instead of the conversation. Totally fine. Casey here. All right. So we're going to kick this off, guys. So design exercises, right? Take home challenges, whiteboarding. Um, in and out of the office, virtual, non-virtual, what are they, how to navigate the situation, red flags, green flags, uh, and just strictly just saying no, and also free work, right? What does that look like? Um, hopefully this conversation, you guys can take away something that, again, you can learn and grow and things to watch out for. Um, me, myself, I have interviewed a ton over the last decade, and I have done my fair share of design exercises and, um, have been burned a couple of times. So again, this is for us to talk about. You guys take it away. Um, but to kick the conversation off, I've got a little bit of an activity to kind of kick it off, right? Kick this conversation. So I'm going to play a little game I made up called Red Flag, Green Flag. All right. I'm going to ask this question, a little prompt. And it's going to be like that uh, 
family feud. You'd hit the buzzer, come right off on mute and just say red flag, green flag, and then start talking, right? And we'll go. A company comes out and asks you as part of your exercise to help them solve a problem in their current product. Red flag, green flag. Red flag. Big red flag. Red. Big red flag. <laughs> All right, Natasha, buzzer, go. Tell me what you think. Um, sometimes it does, it works brilliantly, you know, like it works for you. I've known people who have done such design challenges and got hired and have their products uh, rolled out, their ideas rolled out, but sometimes it's also bad because it's a free, free work. They're basically um, taking advantage of your time to design for them <laughs> and to give them ideas without rights and, you know, and without any acknowledgement. So feel yeah. free to add on anyone. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's a huge red flag also. And for me, it's just design exercise in general. It's just a waste of time. Right. And, it's, and then, like you said, it's not inclusive because if there's nothing we can't get from a design exercise that we can't, you know, get from a portfolio review and also a well-structured, thoughtful interview that it follows, there are waste of time. Right. And I call this out because recruiting and hiring is already, mo you know, monumentally time consuming. And anything that's needlessly takes up time should be excised from the process, especially all these design exercises. Not everybody has the, uh, the time and also just like the availability, right? Um, not every, like for me, I have a kid and I don't have that much time in my hands. And, and one of the things that I actually just experienced about a month ago is company reached out to me regarding a VP position. Um, it's a startup. So I understand that I'll be wearing multiple hats. But at the same time, they're asking me to conduct an exercise with no pay. And it would consist a whole week worth of revamping a product just so they could kind of see how my thought process is. And so for me, I said, uh, you know, I, it was a no for me. And then I explained why. And then I also explained how it's not beneficial for me and it actually won't be beneficial for them. So these are just some of the things that I find that's especially pertaining towards their own product. Because as I mentioned before, and I, I, I believe I mentioned this a lot too, um, also on LinkedIn is designers don't solve problems the same way, right? You know, some taking a lot of data and like kind of like what I mentioned before, some people or some designers just, you know, go into a cave and noodle on it for a while and, and, and come out with, you know, something great. And others just iterate and prototype almost, you know, from the get-go, uncovering, you know, solutions, through refinement and and some require thinking out loud and also deep collaboration to get their best you know their best work and for me a great design organization has just people with variety of problem solving you know modes and it also approaches which enables the organization to better tackle a wide array of challenges right because these artificial constraints of design exercises typically time limited in my case it was five days you know a problem that's pretty much candidate isn't prior familiar with, but which, you know, the interviewers are familiar with already, you know, so and, and also performing under the scrutiny of others, biases just, you know, towards a narrow range of problem solving. And for me, a design exercise by its very nature is inclined towards facile solutions. So biases teams towards facile designers, pretty much there's not really any room for growing depth. And so and that's one of the main things why I don't agree with design exercises. Maggie, I, I, yeah. I, I see you over there. I see you thinking. Uh, no, I, I totally agree. So even anything that just kind of look remotely, suspiciously similar, anything, that's just, that's just a warning sign. You know, I would take that as just run the other, just run, just run the other way. Um, because you kind of got to look for out for yourself, right? Um, I'm, I'm sure we all come in with good intentions and that should be probably the given, but who's gonna look out for yourself better than yourself? You you just never know and you, you, you're better off with other companies who are doing this in a more ethical way um, or who have a more transparent uh, process. And, um, you know, I'm also in the, I don't, 
like design to like take home specifically. I I just think there's a lot of red flags and they're not done properly. They're not communicated properly. Um, they're just not reflective of the type of work you probably want to do in that um, as a UX designer. So that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. I think Joel, you got lucky with like five days. I've got like 30 minutes to come up with something. <laughs> Uh, so this is a story like I've been through this uh, exercise before. Um, same thing, all these red flags came off. Um, but, you know, for me, I've thought like, okay, you know, I haven't actually experienced this before. Let me give it a try, give it a shot, right? The whole challenge was circling around like, oh, we designed this new product. You know, we need to come up with solutions. How do you go launch this thing, right? I was talking to um, one of the lead uh, product and the head of product at that point. Um, and, you know, we went through the exercise that's just meant to exercise, like what I'll give my kind of like high level recommendation within like 20 minutes. Um, and then we do like Q&A. Um, so one of the questions I always like to ask um, when I'm kind of talking to people is like, okay, tell me what's your biggest challenge at work, right? Um, and then, you know, they came back and told me like, oh, yeah, you know, the biggest challenge right now is for us to launch this product. Like, okay, great. So you basically gave the hardest thing that you can possibly do to, for me to solve within 20 minutes. It's like, hey, I mean, you know, is that fair, right? right. Uh, and you're kind of expecting someone to kind of perform under pressure within 20 minutes to solve the biggest thing. So it's like soliciting free work, you know, um, trying to kind of pass the bucket to someone else, getting free ideas. It's just a lot of things that go wrong. And these things can so easily go wrong when it's not done right um, and not done in the best kind of intention. So, yeah. So yeah, what is that intention and how do you navigate that? You know, the question comes up a, a couple of times in the chat, which I'm, I'm following. Should, first of all, how do you navigate that type of situation? What do you, what can you say to that company asking for that? Or, and, and, or should junior entry-level UX designers participate because of, you know, is, is the risk there, right? versus us in senior positions. Right. So I think just to piggyback on all of those from Maggie uh, to Jonathan and, and to you, Casey, is just for me, you know, design exercises, you know, we ask candidates to pretty much perform on demand, right? In the context of a job interview. And that only heightens the fraught power dynamic between the employer and also the prospective candidate, right? And, and even in, in, in the markets where talent is in high demand, job interviews place candidates in a very vulnerable situation. So being expected to perform on demand only adds to the candidate's stress and also anxiety, right? And makes for that suboptimal candidate experience. And like I said, not everybody's the same way. There is a lot of introverts that are out there, that are designers, um, and there's also a lot of extroverts, and, and also there's a lot of ambiverts, right? So we don't really know, and, and, and that's, the often response to a lot of my ranty against, you know, the whole design exercise. And what if, what if they're a take home, right? Or then people have all the time that they need because it's a take home. And it's also, but it's the pressure cooker of performing on demand, you know, because beyond the obvious problem, that's still at the root of all the issues that I have with design exercises. For example, the people in the back, they are just the artificial constructs that actually don't reflect how design actually happens in reality, right? Because they introduce new issues. Namely, now you're asking this particular person to do an unpaid work, right? And other people, you know, with savings, whether it's junior designers, um, newly grad, that kind of have, you know, the free time, they might be able to put a lot more effort into a take-home exercise, right? Versus, say, a, you know, a parent like myself who is at home and, and my time is focused on my, chill, on, on, my, on my child. And also I can only do my homework after my kid is asleep pretty much, right? And when they're likely exhausted and they're not crying and, and, and bickering and so on and so forth. You know, so recognizing all of these, some companies do offer to pay. And I myself, when a company is actually adamant about you know, conducting an exercise, I would ask the CFO or just my, my manager how can we actually compensate these people? Just like user research, right? Whenever I conduct a, a user research, I ask my team, how can we actually pay these people? Whether it's, it's, it's money, whether it's you know, a coffee, whatever it is, right? How can we compensate their time 
for utilizing it for us, right? And also, you know, doing all of these take-home exercises can actually defray costs like, you know, childcare if you pay them. And that's, you know, better than not doing anything at all, but even better, you know, no exercises. For me, I don't see any benefits of design exercise or take-home exercise because we don't need them actually. Um, you know, they, they just don't add any value to the recruiting and as well as the hiring process that can actually can't be figured out, you know, through a thoughtful experience-based interviews and also a savvy portfolio review and speaking with people it's just and kind of getting to know their character versus, you know, what they can do on demand. Because like I said, not everybody is the same way. Um, some people will have stage fright. Some people can't speak in front of a lot of people. Some people just, you know, have so much anxiety, a lot of stress, especially the pandemic that we're facing. All of these, you know, unemployed people are already stressed out that hopefully they get a job tomorrow or next week or next month all these stress are just piling up and then you're going to, you know, give them something that will just add on to it. So for me, that's, that's my add on to that. Natasha, I'm going to kick that back to you. Anything else to add to that one? I have plenty and I'm going to try to play a little bit of devil's advocate at the end. So, um, you know, I agree with Jorel. It's not inclusive. It's also not equitable. And I think uh, Jonathan uh, had said this before, it's such a big place for bias to seep through without proper training. And all of these biases are all unconscious biases that we may not have, like, you know, what we may not be able to check ourselves on because we all want something out of it, right? So that's the first one. The second one is, you know, more often than not, the design problem given to you is actually not a real design problem. And as a hiring manager, I want to see young designers or whoever that I'm hiring solving real design problems. So like, it doesn't reflect the real life scenarios. You don't get to collaborate with a team, just like what Jorel said. You don't get to collaborate with a PM, a developer, and you know, as SME or even your other researcher and stuff. So, and it's, there's so much things wrong with that. Um, there's also like, you know, um, other things like, what are we as design leaders um, propagating in the design community, right? What are we telling all these young designers? Are we telling them that, yeah, go do that stuff on Dribbble. It's going to get like a thousand likes and you're going to be such a great designer out of it. That's definitely one another conversation we should have another topic for another time but that's the other thing that uh that always comes to my mind the flip side of it though um i don't know if you all have experienced this or you have read this before with uh design exercises design exercises are very easy to cheat on especially if they are take-home design exercises there's a ton of threads in reddit for you to google right? What design exercises does Google put out there? What's the right answer? Can I run this by a mentor on EDP list and see what that mentor has uh, to say? And then can I just like submit that? You know, so what does that say about like that currency of trust that we have between an interviewer and interviewee or even our integrity as a designer? So that's the bomb that I was going to drop today. <laughs> Let's keep dropping bombs all night long. Next activity, red flag, green flag. Speaking of collaboration uh, with other folks, as part of a company's interview process, you must engage in a whiteboarding session with another person. Red flag, green flag. Pink. <laughs> pink. Did you say yeah. pink? Yeah. Right. Hello? Ex I think, I think, Explain I your think thought process. Let's go with yeah, it. I, I think I think it's in between. There, there's nothing wrong with a whiteboard exercise, I think. I mean, you know, as far as being able to do it in person or digitally, um, as long as it's not pertaining towards their product, right? Um, I think um, if it's as far as, you know, being able to see if they could actually speak and, and, and come up with a solution, 
But then going back again towards what I was stating earlier, how, like not everybody can actually stand in front of people and present, right? I myself sometimes have stage fright. And then so when that happens, my mind just blank out. And so for me, that means I'm just going to bomb my interview and I'm not going to get it, even though I know it myself, I could do all kinds of design, great designs and, and present great solution for this company. But then, you know, since I am asked to do this whiteboard exercise, I bombed it. But then on the flip side, which is also good for other people, um, you know, I, I have a lot of friends that are very extrovert and, and, and very confident as far as presenting um, their, their cases towards a lot of people. And it's great for them. And, and, and I know some, sometimes it's needed for you to practice your, your you know, public speaking skills. Um, but at the same time, how can we just be fair where it's kind of like going back to junior designers, right? Or, or out, of, out of college that are actually trying to get into um, the design industry. So just to be equal and be fair, I think in my opinion, it should just be squashed and, 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 and just put it away. But it's not, it's not as bad, it's not as red flag as if it was a take home exercise, right? I think, I think as long as they, they minimize the time constraint, let's say, okay, we're gonna have a 30 minute whiteboard exercise just to kind of see how your thought process is. But for me, before I even conduct any of these exercises, and let's say the company really, really is adamant about conducting, whether it's a whiteboard exercise or a take home exercise, I would start in putting, you know, being transparent on the job description, right? Write it down. You know, throughout the interview, we're actually gonna be conducting these exercises, whether it's whiteboard, whether it's a take home exam, whatever it is, maybe, right? At least they can weed out people that are not interested in doing these exercises. And also they can, they can just, you know, I, and being transparent is always conducive to success of any organization in general, right? And, and when you let the candidate know what to expect throughout the interview process, it will help them already, you know, decide if they would even want to apply for that particular company, because let's say for me, company A is, is, you know, this is the job description and it's great, great opportunity. But then, you know, I send my application and they called me, they put me on interview. And the next thing you know, all of these processes are going to be taking place like this. And I think if I saw that in advance, it would help me decide if that's really the right company for me. So I think that would also help. Um, mitigate these particular situations but the whiteboard exercise i would go in the middle um but if we could actually push that aside it would be even better so i i think the whiteboarding exercise can be a good thing because the truth of the matter it is hiring it's always always a big risk for any hiring managers out there it doesn't matter if you're pablo stanley you know, if you can't, if you don't fit, I mean, I love Pablo Stanley, just to be clear, yeah. but, but, you know, like you get what I mean. Like, it doesn't matter if, whether you're a rock star designer, if you can't fit with my team, you can't drive with my team, you can't work collaboratively together. There's no point in like having a rock star designer. So I, I would advocate for, you know, a whiteboarding challenge that is inclusive. And like what you said, Jarrell, a whiteboarding challenge that is equitable, not yeah. a whiteboarding challenge that give them like, hey, be an expert in like consumer or mm -hmm. a B2C in 30 minutes. Not those, right. right? Those whiteboarding challenges where it reflects a uh, how real teams work. So I would love for a whiteboarding challenge that have a PM in it, a designer in it, or even an engineer in it, and then we can problem solve together. Yep. That would be a good platform or a good format where I can assess your ability to collaborate, your ability to be flexible, your ability to think on your feet, and just your ability or even your passion for for design, right? Or your passion in helping people make things better or like make their lives better. So that would be something that I advocate. Um, and that's how, you know, I know in reality, it sounds like, you know, it sounds like utopia, <laughs> but mm -hmm. 
all the rest of like PMs or like engineers are not busy and they can, you know, join us in the whiteboarding challenge. But the truth of the matter is culture fit is very important and it's going to be more important than your hard skills. It's all it is. And I'm not going to bring like a rock star <laughs> designer in, drop them in, and then it will create a ripple of negative culture and my team. So that's what, yeah. I don't know, maybe Maggie or John. Yep. Let me jump in real quick, Maggie. Real, real quick. Go um, for it. I just want to make, I just want to make sure we are clear in the audience with uh, what we're talking about here. Um, uh, just in case that there is a difference between a take home exercise and a whiteboarding challenge, right? So, uh, Maggie, I'm gonna toss it back to you. Maybe um, uh, help further clarify that just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm also like whiteboard exercises tend to be also like a middle ground for me. Um, again, it kind of depends on what are they asking me to do. I've been in some weird exercises before where I'm like, I never want to do that again. And I want to know up front what they're expecting out of me. Like uh, I'm talking, they expect me to do live prototyping during a whiteboard exercise. Yes. Yeah, that was freaking weird. Um, but I see that as an interviewee, as an opportunity to see how they collaborate with me, right? I'm trying to see how we jam as a team. I'm looking for that, you know, fit, kind of like what Natasha alluded to, you know, I want to see if we, we kind of jam together. Do we communicate together? Especially if I'm going to, if these are the people I'm going to be working with, um, ideally you want to be in a room with maybe like a uh, somebody owning the business size and the development side like that is the triad that is the people you're going to be working with maybe a designer too right because they're trying to assess your <laughs> design skills during a, a design interview but you know if if they're being quiet or they're having this power trip that's also t an indication to me that i that's not where I want to be like those to me are red flags it, it, if it's one-sided if they're not giving me what I want I either yeah it, it's also a good opportunity to get to know them yeah it's all about like your top process and it's not really about the solution and and all those things it's about more about your communication and see if you can jam well together as a group yeah and I think just to add on to Natasha and Maggie's statements I think we need to just think of hiring for the future also, right? Because every time we make a hire, you know, we need to think about how they'll actually fit into the team, right? You know, with respect to both their formal and their informal roles, right? And this sometimes, you know, makes more sense if we actually think about our organization. For instance, using a sport analogy, imagine our company is a basketball team, right? Whenever we make a new hire, we need to consider both what position they'll actually play in are they a center? Are they point guard? Whatever it may be, right? And what skills they can actually bring to the table, whether it's shooting, speed, or leadership, right? And beyond that, though, you you know you also need to consider their informal characters. Are they thoughtful playmaker? Are they you know a fighter? Whatever it may be, and you may already have too many of one of those characters, and and also an imbalanced team won't actually perform as well. So if we actually fill our team with a bunch of, let's say, centers, right, or defensemen, we may actually never score a basket. But if we fill our team with power forward, we won't make any plays. So it takes diversity across both, you know, our formal and informal roles to basically make an effective team. And, and kind of like going back to the whole hiring for culture, because it's all about building partnerships, right, and letting those employees build relationships with their clients that is conducive to the success of the culture as well as the organization because if we're just so focused on skill set our job as leaders we wouldn't be here right our job is to pretty much hone their skills to put them to where we are today right and whenever i join a company i always tell my my, my team to, you know, my job is to make one of you guys kick me out of my position because I don't want to stay here forever. So if, if, if I don't see any one of them kicking me out of my spot, that means I'm failing as their leader. So, so for me, I don't even look at resumes when I interview um, candidates. I don't even ask them what school they graduated. I, I talk about resume pretty much at the end of our, our, our chat. 
I, I like to get to know them as a person. I like to get to know them how they actually um, overcame their problems in life. And then from there, you know, I kind of tweak that to a point where how they can apply those challenges that they face throughout their life in, as far as problem solving with design, right? Because everything that we face in life, whether it's design, life in general, they're all the same. It's, it's just all about how you, how do you react? Do you stand back and actually analyze things and before you present solution? And, and you know, it's, it's, it's all the same, especially when we look at this pandemic, right? And, and for me, this is eye-opening. And, and I saw a lot of companies reacted versus you know, analyzing what's really going on. A lot of people got laid off um, because, you know, companies freaked out that they're, oh, oh, we need to keep the company profitable and we need to let go a certain amount of people just so we can keep the company afloat. For me, it's, there's gotta be more to that, right? You have to communicate with your people, you know, let them know what's happening and so forth. And going back to the hiring, same thing. You have to just get to know these people as far as who they really are, what they're passionate about, how they problem solve. And in order for us to do this, we need to also do our due diligence of, you know, looking at their portfolio, asking them who they worked with before and how do they actually, you know, come up with their portfolio. We don't need to, you know, have them take take home exam or sometimes whiteboard exercises because everything on their portfolio says it all already. You can ask them all types of questions as far as, okay, what was your role there? And how did you actually you know, drive the idea all the way to MVP and, and, and all of those factors. You can kind of spot if you're if you're a veteran as far as interviewing people, you would know who's lying and you would know who is actually passionate about the job and and, you know, and actually did what they did. And so for me, that's pretty much how I go off on these things. And yeah, hopefully it makes sense. Yeah, I don't want I don't want to. Um, sorry to cut you off, Jonathan. Um, there is a ton of importance of hiring for the heart and not hiring just on scales. A ton of importance, and it's 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 one of the proven ways of um, getting team engagement, very high uh, retention rate. Because one of the things is that when you hire someone to join your team, you're actually hiring a member of your family. We spend so much time together. Like if I can't stand that person or if that person can stand me, I don't want to make their life miserable for sure. So like it's, it's, it's totally, um, I mean, I've been in so many roles now and the last thing I want to do is waste your time, to be honest. I don't want to waste your time. If you, if you can't drive with the team and if the team doesn't drive with you, I don't want to make your life miserable. Life is short. The pandemic is terrible. <laughs> I want you to live your life happily. And I want you to go to your career, your career progression happily. Sorry, I'm just dropping there. Jonathan, go ahead. No worries. Yeah. I think I don't I don't have such a hard kind of thing against design challenges. I just have a thing against like um, poorly done um, and the ones without preparation. Because uh, I think like there is a role in some of these things to kind of assess like you know thinking pro thought process how people kind of communicate um it's just because a lot of these times these design challenges like wet boring exercise are, are not set up right and they're not properly trained you know you're just basically dropping in it's like oh hey can i put in a product you can I put in engineers to come and join in and then you know when they're assessing it's very different because you, you know, if you don't prep them up you don't tell them like we're not really thinking about the end result we're just kind of like talking to see how this person is um, you know, it, it doesn't set up for success. And the questions definitely you should always go through when you are faced with a design challenge is ask like, what are they evaluating against? You know, what is this actually kind of asking you to do, right? Um, ask those questions. Those are things that you can push back on and ask to clarify because you're not going to be expected to drop in and just perform. Uh, it's a lot of, you know, in a few of the people already talked about this. Um, I did ha I did have a story to share, like because um, one of the ones that I've been through that was really well done and everything was prepped, recruiters prepped me up, they talked me through it. The process became very interesting. The, the design challenges become something that even feel like um, it actually humanizes me uh, when I was experiencing it because they were asking a lot of questions that were not asked before. I feel like really valued as a designer. I was like, oh yeah, they're asking a lot about uh, a lot of these questions about my process, about how I'm thinking, 
Um, so that actually brings out the best in design challenges. But you know, I think you have to actually do the work to set it up. Um, however, on the flip side of it, I think like um, when you're thinking about like, I think uh, I'm counter to the more like seeing how people work together and um, assessing where if you can collaborate with each other. I think I don't know if design challenge is the best way to do it because I feel like they're um, part of like history, like the experience I've been before is we did um, go through exercises before and, you know, uh, I know there was one candidate that, that didn't really communicate really well, didn't feel like, you know, didn't work really well in that, when, under that situation. But then, um, you know, I was the, the deciding uh, um, person at that point, right? So I actually said, like, no, nah, I don't think this person's really kind of gelling with the team. Um, but then, you know, I think uh, other kind of uh, factors that we kind of took in, um, the hiring manager decided to go ahead. Um, that candidate actually became quite a rock within our team um, because like they're not someone who really overtly come out and like talk to you, talk to you about problems. You're not really kind of like close. They need kind of time to warm up. Um, so, you, you know, having that 30 minutes to 45 minutes, expecting someone to kind of like talk to a complete stranger and really quickly warmed up um, to kind of assess how you collaborate. It's, you know, it might not necessarily be the right thing because, you know, we might miss a lot of these good candidates who, you know, might need time because you build a relationship before you actually go in and do a problem, like solve a problem. You talk to stakeholders, you do interviews. So that's kind of like the other factor I'm kind of coming in. There's a lot to take away here. A lot to take away. So we're kind of in the middle for whiteboarding challenges, right? Like how is that interview structured? How is the challenge structured? Is it a place where, and an experience of a friend of mine went through a very long period of interviews. Everything was structured and laid out way beforehand. This is how it's going to be done. And what I really appreciate about what he went through was that there was going to be a whiteboard exercise in this, uh, in this interview. And it was going to be with another uh, UX designer on said product. And what I love, what I loved about what he told me was that he said, you know, they asked me how best I would want, or, you know, I would want to approach it. Like it, it doesn't, it didn't matter if, if you wanted to ask questions, talk about it out loud, heads down, think about it, you know, spend some time by yourself or whatever. They were very inclusive to how that person, how my buddy wanted to, to work on it. And I think that's really important. I think that's a part of that in creating that inclusivity. Now with that said, inclusivity is huge, right? Very important but should interviews be easy? Yeah, I think interviews should be more human, right? And uh, interviews, I look at that as it should be more conversational. And one experience that I actually faced when I was, you know, up in Northern California, even more beyond like this whole Silicon Valley, um, I was speaking with the CEO and we were about to offer this one candidate, you know, the offer already, but the CEO would like to, you know, conduct a kind of like a whiteboard exercise, but it, it's, it's a little bit more different just to kind of see how this person would actually perform. And the way I actually presented a solution is let's, 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 let's make this more of a conversational. And he looked at me very weird and said, how are you going to actually challenge this person? I said, just trust me. And so we took this person to lunch, right? And so I kicked it off as far as talking about how the day is going, you know, we, we ordered food and we were kind of like, kind of like that's the icebreaker, right? Everybody's getting comfortable and we're just chatting it up. And, and this person is actually, or this candidate, it's just, you know, chatting. And, and I could kind of see that by the tone of, you know, this person's voice, it, it's he or she is not nervous anymore. Um, and, and, and so after that particular thing, I actually jumped right into me talking about the favorite product that I'm currently using and why. And then I switched it over to that person, to the candidate, as far as what about yourself? What's your favorite product? And how would you actually do this and this and that? So in, in this person's mind, you know, it's, it's more of a conversational that we're actually just, you know, just also collaborating because we're having conversations, right? Along with the CEO, as far as how can we actually, you know, drive this product from what it is today? How can this person actually improve it? And so by that, th that candidate actually felt more comfortable um, and, and versus being in a, in a square room uh, full of 
five, six, 10 people. And next thing you know, this person's just standing right there and everyone's staring at you and you're just presenting, right? And like I said earlier, that just increased a lot of anxiety and stress. And a lot of the times these people will just blank out, right? And for me, the way I did that is I just, I just wanted it to be more human and more conversational versus anything else. And that made that particular candidate, you know, life's a whole lot more easier. And, and we ended up giving her, you know, giving this person the offer, because like I said, for me, I think, you know, creative doesn't, you can't force it out, right? You can't just squeeze it out of someone's head and expect them to just give you this magic key. Here's the, the key to a wonderful design. I think it happens when you least expect it. Kind of like when I do my one-on-ones with my team, I don't conduct it in a room. I actually take them for a scooter ride or boba, you know, a boba, boba run or a lunch and, and we talk there. And, and for me, I think putting myself in their shoes definitely helps as far as, okay, how, how am I gonna feel if I'm actually sitting right on the other side of the table and they're talking to me about all of these things? So I think, not only being able to relate and also conducting interviews with empathy definitely helps. I I think there's a lot of truths in what you said, Jarrell, conducting interviews with empathy. I think that's the takeaway line there for sure. The thing that um, I was going to say was that there's a reason why we do design challenges, right? Or there's a reason why we do whiteboarding challenges. Um, for me, it's a way to gauge your soft skills and a way to see if you drive with the team, the way if you can work together. The key to that, though, is that making sure that it is carried out with empathy and also carried out in an inclusive way. Um, it's very tricky because there is, you know, like you said, Casey, there is the business side of it, right? What is the business need that I, as a hiring manager, is answering? by hiring someone and carrying this uh, design exercise. So there's there's so many variables in play. There's so many factors in play. I think we as design leaders have the responsibility to make sure that whatever that we're doing is actually equitable because, you know, I'm like you too. <laughs> I'm an introvert. Um, I'm pretty sure after this, I'll just want to go and like, you know, tell my husband to breathe in the other room because I had a long day. Like I need to recharge for sure. Um, but, you know, it's how do we then give a chance to other designers out there? How might we give a chance to designers out there to uh, feel like they're in their element, but also answer our business goals? I think that's the biggest challenge that a ton of like UX hiring managers need to think about. Uh, I think like finding the different uh, counterbalance or like alternative to like design challenge is an interesting one. Um, I think uh, like I always go back to what we're actually evaluating in someone or what when we put a, you know, put someone through a loop um, when you're evaluating, what are you actually evaluating for? Um, if you're hiring for a researcher, you know, you certainly want to get them to ask like the questions, right? You know, know if they actually can do interviews and run all these sessions and understand like what, what it is. Um, to run uh, a research uh, versus someone who is doing a lot more like product and kind of visual uh, is very different. Um, the alternative that we did try before that kind of worked well um, is actually um, having someone to actually deep dive into the design files. Um, and this is more for something like doing a visual and production kind of design role um, and actually have them talk through it see the exploration, see what they, how they set up things. I think that was a very interesting approach. We actually make it really, uh, it gives a lot of um, inclusivity for people who don't have the time poor to kind of put together a really solid portfolio to kind of convince us. Um, and we managed to find like some people who are pretty good um, at doing this stuff just by walking through a design file. Um, so it's a different approach, I would say. Yeah, I and that. I think lastly, um, is as hiring managers, I think we need to also, I think, I mean, it all starts from us, right? What, what, what are we actually looking for? What do we need versus what do we want, right? A lot of the times when you look at startups or just all of these hyper growth, you know, 
companies that are just going through crazy growth, they're just putting people in um, like as quickly as possible. And then so for them, they want to keep the momentum as far as just hiring skills and skills, which is great. Like I said, it, it makes the company profitable. But then at the same time, is that viable or is that is that actually sustainable? Right. Is it going to last you know, more than five years? Is that going to last more than three years? And, and, and kind of like what Natasha was saying earlier is it's like handing out an apple. Right. And, and if I myself is just a rock star designer with a very stinky personality and just be a dick to everyone, it's like putting a hole in that little apple. And next thing you know, you let it sit there for a couple of days, I guarantee you that entire apple would just rot, right? And so I think that is just something that we also need to just, you know, kind of like find a balance as far as what do we actually need? Do we need to also, you know, we're going through, let's say a hyper growth phase. That's actually the, the part where we need to pay attention towards, you know, the culture, right? Because then the, that's pretty much what's going to shape the company. And also, how do we make it profitable? And then from there, if we actually trust these people and, and, and you know, we let them do what they love to do, they'll actually put 200% more in return as far as people that, that are cocky, but they do have the skills. But then those are the people that actually are just arrogant, right? And, and, and I've experienced a lot, and I face a lot of these people. And, and for me, I think it goes a long way if we, if we just hire for character. And, and of course, we need to have, these people need to have foundational skills to make the company profitable, right? But I think I look for skills, more than anything, I mean, I mean, not skills, but um, character more than anything else, and and skills. If it's not all there, my job is to now, you know, help that person shape that skill to where, okay, now, you know, let's 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 shape your skill and make the the, the company that we work for actually more profitable. Because my job also as a design leader is to not make these people feel like they're working for me, right? My job is to make these people also feel as if they're working with me, right? And for me, those all of those things factors in versus just, I'm just a hiring manager and if you don't have the skill, I'll kick you off the curb, so. Well, let's circle back to something that is actionable. Let's create something that we can, our audience can take away from this. So UXers here on this call, designers, interface designers, whatever you do, whoever you are, the chances of you becoming across a design exercise, particularly a take home, is going to come up. It's going to be very, it's going to be very, uh, it's going to happen. All right. Let's just accept that. Um, Maggie, how do you say no professionally? Yeah, that's a good one. I'll also lead that you have the power of choice. Like it, it is really up to you, whatever you, whatever you decide, you can say, no, you can say, I'll do it. You can say, I'll do it with caveats. Um, but you should also assess where in the process you are. Are they asking you to do this even before they even bother talking to you? That's a hard no. I wouldn't even bother to be honest. Um, but if it's something that you're like, hesitant to you can always send them a nice like here's my hourly rate uh you know all professional come up with a rate um or just even further questions like hey what are you assessing um indirect notes right it's like hey i i just would like to clarify can you help me um understand what are you assessing from this um it's just something that i can link you right if maybe there's a project that i have on a deck that i'm like here i address all of those concerns boom right and that can be one way to address it um but ultimately everything's up for negotiation and you have the power of choice you just need to be always very professional consider where you are in the process um and do you really want to work there do you really want to go through that process right there are so many jobs out there there are so many companies hungry to work with you. You know, just figure out uh, where where you stand, and just respect yourself as an interviewee. Burnout is real. Looking for jobs, long process. It's a full time job. Looking for a job is a full time job. So, 
just be conscious of that. Um, that that's all I have to say. Let I me mean, <laughs> thank you, Maggie. Let me caveat that real quick to Jonathan on popcorn this off. Um, so let's say that you you say yes to design challenge, right? Or exercise to take home, but they come to you with their actual product problem to solve. How can you then say no, but let's do a hypothetical instead, Jonathan? Yeah. So I think you just basically answered for me. Like, oh, uh, wow. That's, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, so I think that uh, I think what Maggie says, obviously, you know, like super true. Like uh, you have to exercise uh, the power of choice, right? Um, the whole process is how much uh, a company is evaluating you as a candidate and you actually evaluate a company, whether you want to join them, right? So this is the chance for you to ask questions you know, do your job as a designer, you know, ask questions. That's your superpower, right? You know, ask about brief, ask whether they can do something else. If they're asking for a real project, can you say like, what are you accessing? Uh, what can I actually offer as an alternative um, without going into this area? Just, you know, talk about the truth. Say you're uncomfortable because you don't want this to get into a dicey area. It's always hard when you get into like designing products without having been on it. Um, something hard yet um, ask for alternatives come up with some proposals say like oh can we do something else to assess like what are you trying to kind of assess right um, and this is your chance to kind of um, see how collaborative they are because uh, as much as someone's hiring for you you are also kind of like seeing if you want to join them right if they're open to collaborating they're open to suggestions this is actually a demonstration of how internal culture works because before you actually get in if they're, dem they're putting the best foot forward with you, you can be sure that when you go in, it's not gonna be like, you know, too, too bad. And if they come back and push back hard, then it's kind of up to you to decide whether you wanna kind of go through with, it, with this or not. So exercise your choice. Yeah, so, so many things powerful with that, with that um, phrase there, exercise your choice or you have the power of choice, so powerful. Um, I would add on to something tactical, figure out where you want to be in three years, what kind of designer do you want to be, and whether if that company is the company that would help you get to where you want to be, and use that as criteria to figure out if you want to take that chance to subject yourself to like a design exercise or a whiteboarding exercise. It's all about your career progression and where you want to be, for me at least. I'm I'm a very I'm a very structured person so and I always have like framework and criteria and that has always helped me in my um in my career progression. So I would love for you to try that and if that doesn't work for you there are other ways <laughs> for you to get to where you want to be. I mean I think just I don't know if this is piggybacking but I think just kind of like going back to the root of the whole design exercise, I, I believe that actually boiled way back down to the whole engineering thing, right? Like, because engineering's are actually conducting whiteboard exercises. So why won't designers do all of these things, especially UX designs, right? And, and, and these people, these hiring managers are like, oh, okay, so if these engineering's are actually doing it, why don't we just do it? And one thing that I tell people is just because we can doesn't mean we should, right? And 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 that that for me that phrase also goes back a long way to the whole inclusivity, as far as is it really the right thing just because the engineering departments or you know industry is doing it? Why? How is that beneficial towards the designers, right? And 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 I get it. And like I said, like I, I get where they're coming from, but at the same time, is it really helping? both parties right um, the employers and the potential employees um, is it really beneficial for both of them as far as conducting these exercises because i think it's just a whole copy and paste and what i see you know way back then there is no design challenges nor exercises when i first started it was just in like on print like all of these digital designs that we see nowadays none of these ever existed before. And when I first started in packaging industry, it was all just raw, your hands, you have to be crafty, you have to even create your prototype packages with your with your own bare hands. And, and now, 
everybody is just talking about Sketch, Figma, whatever it may be, whatever the latest software enterprises out there, people are talking about it, right? It's just for me, and also when, when, when I'm interviewing designers, they ask me, you know, what, what software do you guys use? And I tell them, we don't, I don't like to prescribe designers whatever tool, you know, we have. It, for me, I tell them, you know, whatever tool you're comfortable with, use it. And, and all I care about is the result you're actually, you know, producing. And, and I, I want you to be comfortable. I want you to craft the best craft possible out there and, and, and do it as you please. And, and for me, I don't prescribing so many things and, and asking for so many things. I think it's just limiting their, their full potential. Right. And I think as hiring managers, our job is to not limit all of these things from the interview process. Now we're going to start adding design exercise and all these other challenges. So just so we could find out one little, one little, what do you call it? One little factor that, you know, can they actually, do they actually have the skill set? And, and I like, I don't like what I mentioned earlier, their portfolio should speak for itself. Right. And, and, and if you, if we as hiring managers actually do our due diligence of, reviewing their case studies and and possibly even asking them to present case study right and walk us through how they actually executed that particular design would definitely help versus oh here's a take-home design go ahead and noodle on it and you have about 40 minutes to do it or two days to do it and then bring it back to us and then we'll we'll, we'll see if we still want to talk with you and a lot of the times company probably won't even want to reach back you know, reach out to you. And then that's it. They got your idea for free and you spent all these times for nothing. Right. I mean, that, that's just, it's just, yeah, it goes a long way. Well, well then it is uh 6 2 PM PST. That means time for uh Q and a. So if you've got questions, guys, drop them in the chat. We're going to be, I'm going to be asking them, um, some of these I've actually, that we have now we've kind of answered. So I might, I may skip over those. I'm kind of hoping on some, some new ones. Um, we've covered a lot tonight. We've covered, uh, take home challenges. We've take, we've tackled whiteboard and exercises, how to kind of handle the approach, right? It's very sensitive because a lot of entry-level designers, I mean, you're gunning for new positions, right? So taking that risk is a bit paramount. Some of you are going to get burned. I, I mean, we want you, we want to avoid that at all costs, but there is a reality here. And also looking at it from the business angle, business is taking a risk on hiring you. So they do want to flesh out, you know, how you approach a problem, how you collaborate with others, how you work, so on and so forth. I think for me, the best way to do like do interviewing like this is to break it apart into pieces and not use the, the whiteboarding exercise as it's, you know, as gold, right? Don't prioritize that. Just use it as another piece of the interview, right? You've got seven interviews total or eight interviews, you know, panel pr presentation, you've got multiple breakout sessions, you've got whiteboard exercise, use it all as uh, the spectrum to then judge that uh, candidate. So, but again, it's very complex. There's a lot going on, a lot of different companies in the world, but I'm going to jump to the Q and A. So again, drop your, drop your questions in the chat. And I will hope to cover them all. I'm not going to cover them all, but we're going to try. Um, let's see what we've got here. This is, this is one that I really love. Um, how do you hire with your heart and keep equity? Bugger, go. Oh, that's a tough one. But thank you for asking that. Um, I'm going to try to answer that. Maybe, you know, Jarrell definitely have a ton of that. But for me, it's always been behavioral questions, like a real behavioral questions. What I mean by that is give me examples. The more you can share with me, the better it is. The more I can create an environment where I can make you feel like you're part of the team, the more you are, feel, you are at ease in your element, the more you can share you know, more information with me, the better. Um, I always like to say this, 49% hard skills, 51% soft skills. And that's how I assess culture fit. Culture fit is very important for me as a hiring manager because hiring managers or managers, 
in uh, essentially we try to be intentional in how we create the culture of the team. So that's why a culture culture fit is very important for me. Let me bounce off that real quick, Natasha. Culture fit or culture ad? Great question. Culture. So it depends. <laughs> You're gonna have. I used to be a consultant in McKinsey and Company, so all of my all of my answers will have it depends. Culture fit is important. Culture ad is also important. I want to add if I assess that you as a person is a potential positive culture ad. Yes, I'll go for it. And I'll, you know, again, back to my criteria. So where do I want this team to be in three years? And that is how I would determine. I'm not saying that's the only way I'm going to determine whether you are a good culture ad. There are other, other a ton more variables or a ton of factors on how I assess, but that's going to be one of them. Yeah. Yeah, so I think as far as what my two cents would be on this one, um, hiring with heart, but keeping the company, you know, equitable or profitable, right? So that's a great question. So for me, you know, I have a few things to keep in mind whenever you hire with heart, because kind of like what I mentioned earlier, um, skills is something that we can all learn, right? And, and character is something that we can never change. That's just going to be who we are and plain simple, right? I myself, I look for a person that really, it, people can say they're passionate about this and that, right? And I can smell if you really are passionate about something. If not, I won't even want to talk to you after that. And, and, and for me, like I said, because passionate people are insane people. And what do I mean by that, right? Only insane people are the ones that are not going to ever give up on something, whether in life or at work, right? They'll put, it doesn't matter how many hours they actually spent on a project, whether it's already three in the morning and then they have to go back in the office at eight in the morning, they will do it because they're passionate about that. That's their life. That, that's pretty much everything revolves around it, right? And, and then there's these people that are just doing designs just because they hear it from other people. Oh, design industry, you can actually make this much money. And when, 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 when those people come to play and then they say they're passionate about it, I can guarantee you when problem actually rises up, they'll quit because they're not insane enough to put the same amount of effort as much as the real passionate people are, right? And then the few things to keep in mind, you know, we can teach skills because hiring with the heart in mind, you know, it will actually help us find those who work really hard and, and have a good heart at the same time. Because like I said, these real passionate people will put everything that they've got on the plate. And then also there are many other roles that are, you know, that, that need technical skills. But for the most part, if we actually can find someone who is willing to work hard, then, then also willing to be able to, you know, be taught and, 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 and all these other skills that they need, we won't need to worry about if they will actually get the work done or not, right? If they're passionate about it, they are willing to listen. And also we need to have time for training. Because when we do, the, you know, when we do hire someone, we can't expect them to just know everything about the company, right? There's always, at least for me, 90 days of learning curve, right? Whether they've been a senior designer from like all these big companies, it, they're not working for the same company I'm working. So it's different, right? And we need to, we need to be sure that there's enough time training up front. And we need to be transparent about that because they're going to have questions and we need to make sure that, you know, there is a proper onboarding plan because it would also, you know, it, that's very detrimental as far as finding someone who is actually knowledgeable and who has the skills, but it's also unable to work with the rest of our team and who is also not a good fit for our company culture. So one thing to keep in mind is to actually train these particular employees before they even start the job. This way, you know, we know how they interact with others and we can actually see their work ethic. And for me, whenever I start working with a team, I ask them 
how they'd like to be managed. Because for me, just because I managed, let's say, over 100 people in the past with another different company, it doesn't necessarily mean it'll work for the company I'm currently working with now, right? These people are completely different. So I'd like to know how they'd like to be managed by me. And then also, lastly, we can't take too long to hire someone, but also we can't rush it, right? So how do you answer that? Because there will never be a perfect hire. And I think this is where a lot of hiring managers get locked upon. Oh, we need to have this perfect person. There's no such thing. We need to just be decisive and we need to make up our mind. Who do we actually really need, right? But there will be many who will actually be a good fit for our company, right? But if we have a good onboarding plan and also we actually know what we need, we can set you know, and get an amazing hire to become the perfect fit for our company culture. And if it takes, you know, us months to find a good fit for a lower position, then we might want to look at our hiring process or our job descriptions, our interview process, whatever it may be, right? Because this is getting to a point where it's too long for a position to be vacant. So that means there's something wrong internally that we're doing that it's not actually working externally. So I think hiring with heart, we need to also understand how they're feeling. Like, I think kind of like what I mentioned earlier, we need to just hire with empathy, right? How do we, what if the roles were switched? How do we want to treat that person on the other end if we were the one interviewing for that company? I think getting that in our head definitely would help a lot. And then also kind of like what I said earlier is it's just knowing exactly what we want and what we need and, and how it's going to be beneficial for the both the company and that particular employee. So, yeah. I keep muting myself and I never do. So it's like weird when I start talking and I, <clears throat> the mic's muted. So let's talk about the business side of things. Jonathan, Maggie, can you UX slash review the design practice interview process? Should you? Yeah, but you got to be careful for process for the sake of process. <laughs> process think, for the sake of process. Yeah, All right. a, lot, a lot of times um, there are things and I've encountered, not personally, but uh, just friends um, that have been like, hey, I, I can address all these concerns in this matter. Do I still need to, you know, do this process or do this test or whatever they're asking and sometimes the answer is like yeah we just that's just part of the process and that just it can we challenge that I don't know but that's interesting because what does that say about the company's process and and maturity in terms of hiring so I I do think there's a long way to go in terms of maybe we need to think about the interview process um how do we make it better and even from a business perspective, um, so that we maximize time and we reduce, uh, I don't know, burnout and, and all the bad stuff. Yeah, I think self-awareness comes a long way. Um, I think understanding what are your boundaries, um, really bringing that up, because um, that will really point you to ask questions, right? Uh, it's same thing for people who are hiring. It's you know, the job description put together. It's already like a bias thing because you're looking for a certain type of candidate it, it, because that fulfills a business requirement, right? Uh, so I think you know being aware of what are the things you look for and how you evaluate some of these things will need to be very clear and crystal clear. Um, that will really improve overall how you're kind of structuring an interview and hiring, what design challenges are you actually using, um, at the same time, you communicate that very clearly to candidates, right? You have to tell them about what they're going to go through because, you know, you, you don't want someone to come in and that's not like a day-to-day. -day, you just like, hey, drop you in. You're going to be spending 30 minutes. You're going to solve this big problem. Um, and, you know, we got like two hours, right? Um, you got to prep people, make sure, set them up for success, right? Um, you, it's got to go both ways and you know questions asking the right questions asking questions always something we should definitely do all right well that's it 
615 PST, guys. We're going to wrap it up. I'm going to pass it over to Mishope to do our signature selfie. So if you want to turn your camera on, we're going to go through each screen of the, of the uh, Zoom call, take a selfie of everybody, and that will be it for the evening. Um, Mishope, take it off, bud. Okay, all righty. Thank you so much, everyone. Now let's turn on our cameras. Let's smile for the camera. And you know, put on your pose. I'll take the I'll take the pictures slide by slide. So if you can just hold that pose for me, that would be great. Okay, screen one, taking it now. Three, two, one. Thank you. Now I'll be moving across to the second screen. Okay, guys. Three, two, one. Now I'll go across to the third screen. Three two, one, and I'm going to the fourth screen, which is the final screen, and three, two, one. Thank you so much. I'm back to you, Casey. Thank you, Mishope. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us this evening for the session of ADP Lists After Hours Uncensored Edition number six. What, what? All right, let's give a round of applause for our mentors for this evening. We just can't do this without you. Another round of applause for ADP lists themselves or behind the scenes running everything, making sure that I can do my job perfectly. And then one more for yourselves. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Feel free to go out, do something, go to work, go get a drink, go to sleep, whatever you want. But I hope you learned something tonight and uh, make sure you follow us, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, do all the things, guys. Reach out on LinkedIn to the mentors, try to book an appointment. And we'll see you again soon. All right, get out of here, y'all. Bye. Finish that design exercise. Yeah, finish that exercise and submit it, all right? And make sure, hey, if you're doing one, make sure you add in all of your thoughts, right? Like you're like literally thinking out loud. You're like, this is what I would do if I had more time and blah, 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 blah. And like submit that shit. And then an invoice right afterwards. And bam, bam. All right, pay me. Bye. Sweet but a psycho, a little bit psycho. At night she's screaming, I'm on my mind, I'm on my mind. Oh, she's hot.